There's a little lady in, in Graham, North Carolina. If this is not on, I get phone calls. My mother. I couldn't hear you this morning. Surprise, Mama. Uh. It is a joy. To, it's a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad all of you are here, especially those who may be visiting with us. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your row, that we might have a record of your attendance with us today. We're glad that you're with us. Let me share with you just a few announcements. We have our opportunities page in the bulletin, and I encourage you to look at that at your leisure following worship. But there are two, three things I do want to lift up to you. Uh, there are a couple of inserts. The first one is from the K. Buckman Circle, uh, the United Methodist Women. Uh, you have an opportunity to order poinsettias in honor or in memory of someone. Today is the day. I think this is the last Sunday that we'll, this will be in. So we need for you to go ahead and fill that out and get it to the church office. Uh, we use those beautiful poinsettias as part of the uh, decor of the uh, worship areas. And then uh, following worship mm -hmm. or following uh, the, uh, the Advent season, you're invited to take those home, of course. Uh, the other insert you have in there is a, uh, an insert about a Beacon District Christmas offering. Some of you may not realize it. Uh, the United Methodist Church is divided up into districts and conferences and all those things. But anyway, we're in the Beacon District. And uh, there are actually, I know it's hard to believe, but there are actually homes in our district that are still needing repair work from the effects of Hurricane Matthew. And, you know, in the big areas like Lumberton and some of those other areas, we've had a lot of help go down there. And we're glad they've needed that help. We need that help here as well. But it looks like we're going to be the ones as a district to take care of that. And that's what the Beacon District Christmas offering is going for. We've got a couple of homes. One is in uh, Terrell County. And the other one is in Avon, I believe, that needs Terrell County. Pardon me. I'm from the hills. I need help. Thank you. Uh, the other one is in Avon. That's the Avon is right, right? Avon is right. Okay, very good. Uh, that need repair work. And so we're trying to, to raise money to, to take care of those homes that have been affected by Matthew. So we're going to be offering you the opportunity to give toward this very worthy cause through the rest of the, of the Advent Christmas season. And anything you can do to help us with that would be absolutely wonderful. We really appreciate it. I believe, Brother Harry, you've got a video queued up for the Women's Conference. I'll invite you to go ahead and show that right now. All right, our women's conference is coming up, and the opportunity to register for that, ladies, uh, is today, and, and we encourage you. There'll be uh, registration forms out in the Welcome Center following worship. We encourage you to, to, uh, to register for that really wonderful event where there'll be a lot of folks from our whole community who will be there. We encourage you to be part of that as you feel led. Are there other announcements? If not, it is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let us stand now and join together our hearts and voices in worship. This is the second Sunday in Advent. And as we, uh, in, in a little while in our service, we'll be lighting the Advent wreath. And the candle that we'll be lighting today is the John the Baptist candle. And you'll be hearing in our music some of John the Baptist's words, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And we will be reminded to prepare our hearts for the coming celebration of Jesus Christ. It was tradition in Judaism in the time of Jesus to use the shofar, uh, the ram's horn, whenever there was something big and significant. Uh, it was blown often from the, uh, the top pinnacle of the temple. Uh, it was blown uh, to issue in the year of Jubilee and all kinds of other special things. But we're going we're gonna to blow it uh, to issue in Advent, all right, the coming of Christ. And um, hopefully I will do it right. <clears throat>
repay the way of the Lord. Prepay the way of the Lord. Prepay the way of the Lord. Prepay the way of the Lord. another in the name of the Lord this morning and say happy Advent.
Um, one of the things that uh, I like to do, those of you that, my gosh, I've been here, what, nine years now? Something like that. Anyway, those that have uh, had an advent with m me up here before know that I like to take some of the secular Christian, uh, secular Christmas songs and change the words. Um, and it's sort of my little campaign to say, you know, make sure Christ is in the center of Christmas. Nothing wrong with the, the secular words. They're all beautiful. But it's just a little way of doing some of those great tunes, but making sure Christ is, is the reason for the season. Um, so, the silver bells, I've changed it ever so slightly to Christmas bells. And that's one that I want us to do. And we have a special guest, David Christensen, whom I have known for about five minutes and I just went out there and grabbed him I said does anybody play the piano and a couple of uh, uh, Judy and Bill McAdams pointed to him and so I said great you're my man come on David and so anyway he's gonna be playing bells for us and he didn't even know that when he got up this morning but um, anyway uh, it's it's isn't it fun to be a part of the body of Christ and just God's just so awesome and Amazing, and here we go. Ringing church bells, even sleigh bells, and the Savior is born. As the Christians come gather for worship, candles glowing, tree lights showing. You are full of surprises. Sometimes we plan and we think everything's going one way and then our plans seem to go awry, but underneath are those wonderful, everlasting, eternal, loving arms and things just seem to, to work out. God, in this season, we have so many plans, so many things we think are going to be this way or that way. However they actually go, we put them in your hands. Even if it's our burnt turkey or our collapsing tree or the present that we didn't get, <laughs> we put it all in your hands. And we pray that through this season we may grow closer to you we may learn the real reason for the season the baby in the manger and whatever else goes wrong he goes right 
And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Peyton and Kennedy Blunt and their family to come forward to light our Advent wreath. stable over here. We're going to learn the story of a special man named Joseph. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. So I have a special figure under this tree, and I want Sarah Beth. Can you grab the figure under there and put it in the manger scene? Yeah. All right, so what we can learn from Joseph in just this passage is that he had a huge heart. While the world at the time would shun Mary for having a child out of wedlock and um, he, he could have easily condemned her to death for it. Um, he instead wanted to quietly dismiss her um, and that would allow her to continue living on and um, fulfilling God's promise um, to us and bring the Savior to us. 
Um, and when the angel of the Lord came, he had such a big heart that he um, accepted what the angel had said to him and allowed Mary to stay with him for the rest of his life. Um, so, Joseph is, a, is an integral figure of this scene, um, and often he's quiet in the background, but we, we should know that he had such a big heart, and we should have big hearts ourselves. So, um, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for providing all of us with the big hearts that we need to provide the love and the support to those who need it. Thank you, and we love you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, and I have some wise men in the back here that need to travel a little bit closer to the stable. So we'll all go back, grab them, and move them to one of these windows. Let me return this mic while we go back. God is good all the time. Uh, last Sunday I was a pretender. This Sunday I am the original. So we have praises and prayers. It's a special time of year, and there are people that uh, aren't as fortunate as we are. So please keep them in your prayers, but be active in your support of them by more than prayers. Okay, so we're going to start on this side. Hey, Danny. You look mighty crispy with that red sweater on, brother. Okay, this side. Not nary soul. Okay, middle. Ray and I went to Raleigh yesterday and went to a basketball game, which would not normally be that big of a deal, but this basketball game had Hayes playing basketball. Wow. And he's our little grandson that you've been praying for all these years, and there he was playing basketball for the Y. So I just can't thank you enough for your prayers. Christmas and travels. Oh. Continue prayers for Patty Jackson. Thank you. I have a praise this morning. Our family, extended family, was blessed on Friday with twin nieces, or great nieces actually, um, and mom and baby girls are all doing great. I would like to ask for praises and prayers for our military and our military families all over the world at this time of the year especially, and for our first responders and all those that help to keep us safe every single day.
Thank you, Lee. Okay, this side, the, the far side. Um, I would like prayers for my family in Boston on Jane's side. Um, Jane's sister-in-law just died of Alzheimer's um, yesterday, and Jane's sister died of Alzheimer's, and Jane died of Alzheimer's. Um, and that's prayers for their family. Uh, and I'd like praises for uh, the Alzheimer's Association in North Carolina that um, we raised funds for Alzheimer's research, and uh, we raised so far $125,000, and all went to ECU for focused research on Alzheimer's. And uh, I praise God that uh, we've been able to do that, and just keep in mind uh, the Alzheimer's walks that we have during the year, and also we do the fundraising uh, dinner dance at the, uh, at the Civic Center once a year. And all that helps to raise money for Alzheimer's. Thank you. Prayer and praises for our church family and the community of Washington and Chakawinity. We have people in this church and outside of this church that, that are struggling on a daily basis. Uh, this is a special time. If you know someone, spend some time with them. If you have the resources, spend some money with them. Uh, there are people who are struggling with... Uh, Alzheimer's. There are people who are struggling with uh, children that have gone astray. There are people that struggle with their family relations. So please let's think about them and, and uh, as we uh, pray together the Lord's Prayer, let us remember them and uh, please be active, not just now, but the rest of the year of 2018. Now, Bow your heads and, and, and let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. Give those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a joy to see you this morning. It is good to be seen. I realized that uh, one announcement I did not make, I want to make now, Next Sunday at 11 in the historic sanctuary, we will have our annual Christmas cantata. I announce it to you, one, because it's good music, and two, because some of our folks are going to be involved in making the music. So we hope you'll come out. We'll have our regular worship service. And then I hope you'll stick around to hear some good music following as well. So we hope you'll be a part of that. Uh, speaking of music, there's a, a really <laughs> fantastic piece of music that is played at this particular time of the year. It means a lot to me. Uh, written by a fellow named Georg Friedrich Handel. Handel. Handel's Messiah. Beautiful. I had the privilege of going to God's house in West Durham on the campus of a certain university to hear that production many years ago. And those of you who've heard the Messiah know that it begins with that beautiful song, Comfort Ye My People, straight from the 40th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And I lift that up because our text for today is a fulfillment of that 40th chapter. After you read those words of comfort ye my people, you get down about the second verse and we hear about the voice of one in the wilderness crying, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. 
Reckon who that is. Well, we know who that is, and that's who we're going to be hearing about this morning. Our text for this day comes to us from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. We love the Gospel of Mark. We believe it was the earliest of the Gospels written. I like to call it the Dragnet Gospel. You all know the Dragnet show many years ago, Jack Webb? Just the facts. Jesus is immediately everywhere, and immediately he's here, and immediately he's there, and things happen. It's just the facts. So this is a beautiful passage of Scripture, and this is how Mark opens up his gospel. We're looking at the first chapter. We're looking at verses 1 to 8. I invite you now to give ear to the reading of the Word of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a good beginning. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a leather girdle around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God and the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are once again in this season where we think we know how everything works. And yet here you always show up and surprise us. Thank you for surprises. We ask God that you would fill us to overflowing with your good news this day. Amen. Uh, we've just finished up the first full week of December and there is no doubt about it you've ever driven through my neighborhood anyway, we are smack dab, as they say from where I come, in the midst of the holiday season. Lights and decorations are everywhere. For many years, Carrie worked in an office on Guest Road in Durham, very busy thoroughfare, and all of those businesses would, every year in the holiday season, they would get decked out and it'd be beautiful. I remember, though, one year in particular when there was a very unusual and dissonant addition to that holiday tableau. I remember one year there was a guy walking alongside of Guest Road, and in one hand he had a sign that told people to repent, and in the other hand he had a bullhorn through which he proclaimed his message to all the passers-by. Now, you would think that that kind of thing would draw a whole lot of attention, right? But I watched him one day, and as he did his best to proclaim that message, the pedestrians and the drivers passed him by without so much as giving him a second look. For them... It was just Christmas business as usual. Well, I, I couldn't help myself but think back about that fella when I read our text for this day. Because our text is introducing to us the person of John the Baptist. Now, if you think about somebody being out of place in the holiday season, it would have to be without a doubt. At least on the surface, it looks like John sticks out like a sore thumb. Think about it. 
All during this holiday season, uh, we're treated to the sights of beautiful decorations and sparkling lights, and we watch all of the specials on Hallmark TV where everybody falls in love in two hours or less. And we sing the Christmas carols, and we're all filled with happiness, and we're having a holly jolly good time. And then on the second Sunday of Advent, we come to church and run headlong into the grim, austere character of John the Baptist. I mean, look at him. His hair looks like he had never been to Great Clips and doesn't know anything about product. It's everywhere. He's not wearing an ugly Christmas sweater or a, a, a Christmas tie. He's dressed in camel hair. And that's not a turkey sandwich and fruitcake he's munching on either. It's locust and wild honey. Everybody said, yum. And instead of singing, have a holly jolly Christmas, he steps forward and proclaims those words from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. And all of God's people said, do what? What's going on here? Why is he here in this season? Well, contrary to popular belief, people thinking that he's out of place, John's not out of place at all. He's very much in place. He has an important role because he has come to interrupt our festivities with an important announcement. John is here to cut through all of the tinsel and trimmings and all of the preconceived notions we have in order to get us back to the essence of the message of this season and of the gospel. Brother John has showed up this morning to interrupt our festivities to remind us that you and I serve a God who is apt to show up at unexpected times, in unexpected places, through unexpected means, and in unexpected ways. When the people were not expecting anything to happen. They were just busy living life. You may ever tell you that, man, I, I don't notice anything. I'm too busy living life. I'm just trying to live life. I said that myself. When they're not doing anything but living life, all of a sudden, what happens? John emerges. Now, it's true that people had received the promise of the Messiah many years before, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets had spoke about it, but there had not been a prophetic voice raised in Israel for hundreds of years. Think about that. As the years continued to pass, it seemed that God was oblivious to their plight and was ignoring them, and so the people began to despair, and pretty soon they just forgot about it altogether because they were too busy living life. Silence. Nothing. And then, in the desert, that wild man emerges and declares, prepare the way of the Lord. Surprise! Here I am. Like my friend on Guest Road, he struck a figure. But unlike my friend on Guest Road, we're told that throngs came to the desert to hear John and his message. When the time was right, in God's time, in Kairos time, in God's time, God chose to show up and make his plan known in the most unlikely place through the most unlikely character you could imagine. But isn't that just like God? So often God's modus operandi with his human creation is that of unexpectedness, of surprise, of showing up in the most unlikely places through the most unlikely people in the most unlikely ways in order to share his love, his mercy, his grace, his presence. Here I am, surprise! In her, book, in her book, Saving Leonardo, Nancy Percy talked about a very interesting 
evangelistic wave sweeping through Japan, and it was coming through, of all things, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. The godly composer's witness and life story, the beauty of the music, and the gospel-centered lyrics of his songs had begun to work in the hearts of the Japanese people. And, and Miss Piercy, she quotes a, a composer in her book, Masai Suzuki. And he says, it happens every time. After a Bach concert, people will surround my podium and they'll begin to ask me questions. And inevitably, they ask the same question. What does hope mean to followers of Jesus? And it's my belief that hundreds of Japanese have been converted to Christianity through the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Can you imagine that? Think about that. You go to a concert just to hear some good Baroque music, nothing else in mind. And then as you're just sitting there jamming on the tunes, all of a sudden, God shows up and shares his truth and changes life. Doesn't have to be Baroque music, incidentally. Maybe you go to a concert. Maybe you didn't even want to go. You sit there and you're listening, and as you listen, something happens. Maybe it's a book you read or a movie you saw or people you went to visit. You really didn't want to go, but when you went, guess what? God was there, and you didn't even realize it. Isn't that just like God? When you least expect him, guess what? You better expect him. Who in the world would have thought God would have chosen to work his redemption in the way that he did? Working through a stable in Bethlehem. Who saw that coming? I want to know. Nobody did. And that's what John is trying to communicate to us. To those of us who have our routine, who are just living life, who think we've got the holiday season all figured out, it's supposed to happen this way, we go to mama's and eat, and then we trim the tree. You, you think you got your plan worked out, but John is here to tell you, hey, wake up, because when you least expect it, God is going to show up in unexpected places and unexpected ways. Be on your toes. Brother John, we're glad he stopped by because he's interrupted our festivities to remind us that the best way to be ready for this gift of grace from God is to do so through the act of repentance. Well, the roof didn't fall in. That's good. Like my friend on Guest Road, John came forward and the scriptures tell us he was proclaiming a message of baptism for the repentance of sins. Unlike my friend on Guest Road who couldn't draw a crowd, we're told that the whole of the Judean countryside came to hear John preach that message and many of those people underwent baptism even though their religious affiliation did not require that of them. There was something about John's proclamation of repentance through baptism that meant so much to them, that counted so much to them, they were willing to do it no matter how ridiculous it might have made them feel, no matter how unusual it might have seemed, no matter how many people might have talked about them because they did it, it meant so much to them, they wanted to do it. Now, I understand that repentance is not a word we hear a lot in the church nowadays, and certainly not in the Christmas season. But thinking about it very simply, repentance is just this. It is our willingness with the help of God to turn our lives away from those things that distract us from God and his grace and turning our lives instead toward those things that draw us closer to God. That's what repentance is. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Why do so many people resist that idea? Thinking about this topic in his book entitled Unapologetic, Francis Spuford wrote this. He said, Christianity is not supposed to be about gathering up only the good people, happy, shiny, squeaky clean, 
and ignoring the bad people. Frightening, alien, disgusting. Because the truth of the matter is, there are no good people. This flies straight into, uh, as opposed to the truth that many people believe about Christian communities being fastidious, prissy little enclaves removed from life's messier zones. What Christianity is supposed to be is a league of the guilty. Can we tell the truth in here this morning? If you can't tell the truth, we need to go home. The truth of the matter is, we're really not comfortable with thinking the idea that we're sinful, that we're wrong that we are broken, that we need to be repaired, that we need to be changed, that we need to be remade and transformed. If we're telling the truth this morning, we really want to live life like we want to live life. And we expect God to change things to suit our needs and wants, not the other way around. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it doesn't work that way. We live in a world where most everybody assumes that nearly everybody is good enough to make the nice list. But John has come to interrupt our festivities, our little glad-handing, self-love, pride fest, our little universalist party, and say to us that if we're not willing to prepare for the unexpected visit of God through repentance, we really don't stand a chance. I'm glad Brother John passed by because he's shown up to interrupt our festivities by reminding us of the true message and the true meaning of this season. When John came out and he was preaching, there were a lot of people who thought they had it figured out. They looked at John and said, aha, that's the guy. That's the one we've been looking for. We've solved the problem. We've solved the, the, the question, the mystery. He's the one. He's the one. And they asked him, and he said, no, no, I'm not the one. I'm pointing you toward the one who's coming, who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is going to renew creation. He is the one who is going to offer salvation and eternal life to everybody who will receive it. The folks thought they had it all figured out. They thought they knew why John was there. And yet John is telling them, I'm not the message. I'm just the messenger. I am the signpost trying to point you to the true message. The truth of the matter is, we're really good at all of the trappings, all the routines. We're pretty good at the, the Christmas celebration routine. We're good at that. But how good are we at really understanding the meaning and the reason and the message of what we do? How do we understand that? Dr. John Huffman talked about inviting his staff from the church to come to his home for a pre-Christmas celebration. They had a great meal. And afterwards, the staff, when he were all sitting around, they were doing this white elephant Christmas exchange. One of the persons got a gift bag and reached in, and they pulled out a little ceramic figure of the baby Jesus. Dr. Huffman's wife immediately recognized that this was the baby Jesus from their manger scene. Somehow, it had fallen from its place and into the bag, and so she quickly retrieved it, and they put baby Jesus back in the manger, and everybody had a good laugh, but Dr. Huffman wrote later on, he said, you know, more, the more I thought about that situation, the more telling it truly was. So often, we have the tendency to sweep Christ uh, out of the center of the Christmas festivities and relegate him to a sort of white elephant role. How sad that is when he is so central to the message. What is the message and the meaning of this season for us? Is it, Lord, we've got to survive all these people coming to visit? If I can just get these presents wrapped, if I can just send out more Christmas cards than my neighbor, if I can get all the decorations up, if I can go through all these parties and activities, is that the, is that the message and meaning? 
Because the scriptures tell us that as Christians, the message and meaning for us is to be found in a dusty, musty, smelly stable in a backwater burg called Bethlehem. And it's Brother John who on this second Sunday of Advent has stopped by to interrupt our preconceived notions of what this season is supposed to mean in order to tell us the true meaning and message of the season. In the midst of all of our celebration, in the midst of this season, we are grateful for the visit of the grim figure of John the Baptist. Because he's come to interrupt our festivities with some important words for us to tell us that God continues to show up in our midst in the most unlikely places, in the most unlikely ways, at the most unlikely time. To tell us that as we prepare to receive that visit through repentance, we will come to know this season has a deeper and more meaningful reason than we ever realized. So I don't know about you, I'm kind of glad Brother John stopped by. I hope he'll come by anytime he's around. Although Brother John, if you would, next time, leave the locust at home. Thanks be to God. Amen. Once more we prepare ourselves to come to the table of the Lord. We don't have the right or the desire to deny anybody that opportunity, though none of us are worthy of our own merits to even gather the crumbs from beneath the table. The privilege of coming to this table as a child of the king was bought for us at great price. What is required of us is to have a humble and a repentant heart, a desire to really understand what this season is about, to look for God to show up when we least expect him to, to give ourselves to him through repentance and to understand what it's all about. So at the appropriate time, come as you feel led. The method we use here is intention. We'll have some stations here at the front. You'll be given a piece of bread. You'll be invited to dip in the chalice and receive communion, after which you may kneel at the altar for a time of prayer, or you may return to your seats. On a night long ago, when our Lord prepared to give himself as the greatest gift of all, he called his disciples together after a meal and he took a piece of bread and he gave thanks to God for the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, I want you to take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup from the table and he gave thanks to God. He gave it to his disciples and said, I want you to drink from this, all of you, because this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. We'll ask the members of our praise team and those who've been asked to help serve to come first. All things are ready. Come away. No weak excuses frame. Come take your places at the feast and bless the Founder's name.
One of my favorite stories about John the Baptist comes from Dr. Will Willman, Bishop Will Willman, retired bishop. You've probably heard me tell this before. You'll hear me tell it many more times. It's such a good story. He said, you know, you don't really see any John the Baptist Christmas ornaments. And nobody I know has ever gotten a John the Baptist Christmas card. You know, that grim, imposing figure on the front. You brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And you open it up inside, and it says, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I think bad, John gets kind of a bad rap. He showed up with a good message at the right time, so we're very thankful for that. And we'll take that message to heart. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Remember all that's going on. Until we are together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.